Hey everybody, this is Mark Smith. I'm the online Sunday school teacher at Red House Baptist and um, just want to welcome you and I thank you so much for joining me and watching this. And guys, I'm striving to keep these things pretty brief. I know how important your time is and uh, you know, I hate to interrupt uh, you as you try to get to sleep. So maybe this would be something, I'm just kidding, of course, but um, I am glad that you've tuned in and I hope that uh, you go back and maybe even look at some of the older ones if you're just joining us. And uh, we have just finished up a study in the book of Job and are starting our study of Ecclesiastes. And I'll have to be honest with you. So Pam and I were talking, um, it was one night this week, I think maybe even Sunday night. Uh, we were both starting kind of our study and I'd, I'd already read through my my verses for uh, this lesson and Pam was starting her reading of Ecclesiastes and she said, boy, this is going to be tough. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, we've just gone from Job into Ecclesiastes. And, you know, I'd kind of begun to think some of the same things, but as uh, I, I was looking and preparing this lesson, you know, I just, God is amazing and his word is amazing and it speaks to us sometimes, even when we don't realize um, really, uh, how important certain things are to just be reminded of. And I think he does that through the book of Ecclesiastes and through, through Solomon. So anyway, um, guys, I'm glad you're with me. Let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer and we'll get started with today's lesson. Lord God, we just thank you so much for this day. I thank you so much for the gifts that you give us, Father, and just for your grace and for your mercy that, Father God, we know we don't deserve, but uh, Father, I just, I give you all the praise and all the glory for blessing us so abundantly. And Father, I just want to lift up each of those, Father, uh, in our church family, but Father, also in our community and just friends and family who are going through so many difficult things right now. Father, those who've lost loved ones, those who are dealing with sickness, God, I just lift each and every one of them up to you. And Father, we just know that there have been uh, some people even within our family who've lost their jobs recently. And Father, I just want uh, to, to ask for your leadership and your lordship in their lives, Father, that you would just guide them into an area where you would have them to be. Father, I trust you. I praise you. I thank you. And I just thank you for your word. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right. So uh, the title of today's lesson is What's the Use? And you think, well, let's try to spin this into something positive. And it really is but a wise person seeks to find meaning in life from God. And it does come from Ecclesiastes 1, verses 12 through 15, and 2, verses 18 through 26. And again, I, I do this quite often as we kind of jump around within uh, uh, the Bible. I encourage you to go back and read the parts that we're skipping over that are the focal point of our lesson. Uh, so, so do that, and it kind of ties a lot of these things together. So just as an introduction to this, what are some of the things that disturb you about modern culture? Some of you may say, well, nothing does. I love modern culture. Uh, you know, I think it's great. And there certainly are some positive aspects to modern culture. But I'm asking, what is it that bothers you about it? And, you know, for most of us, we can clearly see the turning from God in our world today. Um, in decades past, we look to Europe and we say, oh, wow, Europe, you know, their church membership is down, church attendance is down. Um, the importance of the church and of, of their spiritual lives has just kind of dwindled. We saw that 30, 40 years ago. Um, but in more recent years, we're seeing that here in the United States. We were founded as a Christian nation. and We've become less so in terms of church membership, church attendance, and even those who profess Jesus as Lord. And that's that's something that really bothers me. And, and I, I see that it was just a trend. It was something that was beginning to happen, like I said, in Europe, and then it's made its way over here as well. So how can we as Christians navigate a culture in which we live and not be changed by that culture? So, you know, that can be tough. That can be extremely difficult because we're immersed in this modern culture. If you turn on the television, if you watch movies, uh, social media, educational institutions, even churches seem to be inundating us with ideas and influences that are contrary to what God wants for us. How do we know that? How do we know what God wants for us? Well, he gave us his word. He gave us the, the Holy Scriptures, his God-breathed scriptures so that we would know what he wants. Because guys, here we are in this world, but we're not to be 
influenced by the world. At least don't not, not let the world influence or dominate what's on our minds. So are we spending time with God or are we spending our time allowing the culture to drown out his voice? You know, what, what are we choosing to do? And, and we do have a choice in all of that. So as we begin our study in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon why Solomon asks the same kind of questions as he ages and as he's nearing the end of his life. What's the meaning in all of this? And uh, you, you see the caption that I have up there at the top of the up the top of the page. It says the meaning of life is blank. And I, I hope your answer, I hope today's lesson leads you to the answer that God expects us to be able to come up with. So let's go ahead and, and look at today's uh, scripture verses, and we'll start with Ecclesiastes 1 and look at verses 12 through 15. In fact, let, let me go ahead and just, I want to read to you uh, uh, Ecclesiastes 1 verses uh, 1 through 3, okay? Just kind of give you an idea of the introduction of Ecclesiastes. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, Absolute futility, says the teacher. Absolute futility. Everything is futile. What does a man gain for all his efforts? He labors at under the sun. So you read that, and that kind of is our introduction to Ecclesiastes. But as we jump in verse 12 to 15, I, the teacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my mind to examine and explore through wisdom all that is done under heaven. God is giving people this miserable task to keep them occupied. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun and have found everything to be futile, a pursuit of the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. Again, those are pretty, those are pretty, desperate words, at least it sounds that way at, at first look. So let me ask this, how would you like to be president of the United States? Okay, how about just governor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky or whatever state you're in? How about mayor of Richmond or whatever city you're in? How about pastor of Red House Baptist Church or whatever church you happen to belong to? How about just head of your home? How would you like to be head of your home? And each one of those, some people jump at the opportunity and they say, I want to be in charge. I want, I want to have power. Okay. Others look at that, not so much. Okay. You may look at that and say, I don't want to have to do any of those things. But my point in asking that question is that each of these roles comes with enormous responsibilities. Oftentimes, people in position of leadership feel isolated and alone because of the enormity of the responsibilities that they have. Making wise decisions that affect other people can be extremely difficult. And I meant to put this up there and I didn't, but I'd, I'd, I'd love to have had the time to just go through and look at presidents, pictures of presidents when they come into office and then as they're leaving office. And if they've been in office for four years, it looks like they've aged 10 years. If they've been in office for eight years, it looks like they've aged 20 years. All right. It just the office itself and the enormity of it, of the responsibility weighs heavily on people. So how does Solomon seek to answer the question of life's meaning as the king of Israel? How did he seek to answer that? Well, through wisdom. He had asked God for wisdom and God granted that to him. You know, he didn't ask for wealth. He didn't ask for power. He didn't ask for all those things. He asked for wisdom. And God said, here you go. You, and Solomon was the wisest of all men, but still miserable as he tried to make sense of this world and all that there is in this world. And you think, well, why would he be so miserable? He's got power. He's got wealth. He's even got wisdom. He's a godly man. Why in the world would he be miserable? Well, that's what he says. I applied my mind to examine and explore through wisdom all that is done under heaven. God has given people this miserable task. How does Solomon view the task of trying to discern life's meaning or meanings? And he says it's miserable, but he also says it's futile. So basically saying it's not going to last forever. Now, you, you might be wise for now. You might gain some understanding, but it's gone. You're going to live this short life here on earth and you're going to die. And man, that just sounds miserable. But this is a man who is wise and he's looked back on his life 
And he's saying that, you know, I've, I've done all of these things and none of them have filled me with the kind of joy that I want. All right. And we'll, we're going to come back to that. So just kind of hang on to that idea. So how does increased knowledge and wisdom sometimes lead to greater sorrow? Well, we become more aware of how things are in this life and just how cruel life here can be. And as a parent, I wanted to protect my children. I want my children to remain children for as long as possible. I don't want them inundated with the things of this world. You know, and I just think about raising children today and how difficult that must be. You know, one of the things that, that uh, you know, was kind of simple was you're a boy, you're a girl. Children today are growing up in a world where, man, that's not, it's not always what people say. And it has to be confusing. And we want to protect our children from, from that sort of stuff. But at the same time, we want to teach them right from wrong. And we want them spending time with God. And, and we want to teach them about the dangers of living in a sinful world. That's, and that's what we have, that's what we're tasked to do. And guess, wisdom, the more you know, kind of the more difficult it is to, to deal with some of those things. You've heard the term, ignorance is bliss. Sometimes I'll bet it is, all right? Because as we learn more and as we know more and as, as we become more aware, man, life's tough. So what does Solomon find in his days? that were new to him or new to earth. So granted, Solomon lived a long life, but in the grand scheme of things, it was a whisper and nothing. There's nothing new. We sometimes get worked up about things that are happening in our lives, and I do this, and in our culture, and the delivery systems may be new. It may be that you know you have cell phone technology, computer technology, you have uh, the speed of, of information, you have social media, but the same sins and the same pursuits exist just like they did in Solomon's day. Nothing is new. Solomon was like us, though, in that he had just a very limited perspective. All right. He couldn't see what was going to happen in our day and age. Now, he knew a little bit about what happened prior to his day and age and what was going on in his life. But he could not see a day in which we could communicate in real time all the way across the globe. All right. Uh, that, that just would have blown his mind. Right. Because he he didn't see that he was wise, but he didn't know everything. Who knew that was going to happen? God did. God, God knew what was going to happen from before he ever spoke earth into an, into existence. So what happens when we seek to find meaning in life, in our work, in our family, in anything apart from God? What happens? Well, we become despondent. If we seek joy in the things of this life, now notice I said joy. There are things in this life that I, am, I, I love to play golf. I, I thoroughly enjoy that. I enjoy gardening. I enjoy things in this life. There are things that, that can make us happy in the short term. But when it comes to joy, the joys of this life, we're going to be disappointed because they're fleeting. They go away. Eternal peace and eternal joy are from God. And then, you know, and I marked this. I just I wanted to make sure that this was emphasized. But in Matthew chapter six, verse thirty three. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you, okay, including joy. If you're trying to find joy, if you're trying to find peace, if you're trying to find contentment in the things of this world, in the things of this life, whatever they are, it's not going to happen. You're not going to find it in work and in play and in relationships and in anything that comes from God. All right, so as we move on here, guys, let's look at a key. Ecclesiastes 2, verses 18 through 21. And this again is Solomon. I hated all my work that I labored at under the sun because I must leave it to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. 
Yet he will take over all my work that I labored at skillfully under the sun. This too is futile. So I began to give myself over to despair concerning all my work that I had labored at under the sun. When there is a person whose work was done with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and he must give his portion to a person who has not worked for it, this too is futile and a great wrong. Man, you know, the, again, he's looking back. He's accomplished so much, but at the end of his life, he's looking at this and basically saying, so what? Okay, guess why do we work? And I say that the understanding that I've recently retired, and many of you know that, but why do people work? Well, we work to make money, if we're being honest, to provide for ourselves and for our family. Uh, we work to uh, have an impact on others. You know, Pam and I both taught in the public schools, and we felt like we, we had an opportunity to impact other people and young people. Um, we work because God commanded us to do so. We go all the way back to Genesis. And initially, Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, and they were to work in the garden and, and eat of the fruit that they, that they worked at. But it was, it was easy work, and it was um, fun work. And then sin crept in, and then all of a sudden, the work wasn't always fun. You had thorns, and you had weeds, and you had all sorts of things that, that made life much more difficult. Okay, uh, Solomon seems to have stumbled on that nugget of wisdom. Work isn't always joyful, all right? And for him, he would turn around and look back at what he had accomplished, but then he thought, I'm going to be leaving it all, all right? And, and that's what's going to happen for every one of us. See, what is the problem with this life's work? Whatever he's created, built, amassed, doesn't matter what it is, it's going to be left to his offspring and the heirs of his life's work. All right, that's what's going to happen. In short, he can't take it with him. You can't take it with you. I can't take it with me. There's only so much joy that's going to be derived from the stuff that we have. All right. So as a result, he began to wonder why he had worked so hard to gain so much stuff. And man, that ought to scream at us. You know, what do we get for having all this stuff? And we're blessed with some things, some stuff, but Man, what happens when that becomes your focus? In essence, what would Solomon like to do with his life's accomplishments? What would he like to do with them? He'd like to be in control of them forever. That's what he'd like. Even after he's dead, he wants to control who gets this, what is going to happen next. He wants to write down on a piece of paper that here's what my next heir is going to do, and then his heir is going to do these things. That's what he wants, and we can sometimes be like that, when we seek to control our own lives, or maybe even the lives of others, even after we're gone. Okay, and that's not going to happen. Solomon figured that out. Therefore, our treasures don't need to be stored up here. Okay, you look at that money, you look at that cash in that picture. There's nothing to prevent your heirs. You said, oh, I'm saving up my money and I'm going to give it to my children and my grandchildren and that way it's going to make their lives easier and I hope they do this with it and I want them to do that with it. Because they might just do that with it. Right? And there's nothing you can do about it. Zero. So where are you going to store up your treasures? And I hope those treasures are stored up in heaven where they can't be touched by moth, by fire. They can't be stolen. They're there for eternity. All right, let's look at the next set of verses. So verses 22 through 26, also of chapter two. For what does a person get with all his work and all his efforts that he labors at under the sun? For all his days are filled with grief and his occupation is sorrowful. Even at night, his mind is not rest. This too is futile. There is nothing better for a person than to eat, drink, and enjoy his work. I have seen that even this is from God's hand. Because who can eat and who can enjoy love, life apart from him? For to the person who is pleasing in his sight, he gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and accumulating in order to give to the one who is pleasing in God's sight. This too is futile and a pursuit of the wind, all right? And that, talk about eating and drinking and enjoying, and I look at that, and that, that looks to me 
to be some sort of a chocolate cheesecake. I don't know that it is, maybe an Oreo crust. I enjoy those sorts of things. So how many of you have stayed up at night though, worrying about a project at work or a problem at work? And I'll bet if you're being honest, every single one of you will say you've done that from time to time. And perhaps you had a good reason to. Perhaps there was a project that you're just, you're stuck and you're thinking, you know, if I can just find a way around this and I can get that done. And that's, that's fine. I understand that. And I think that's good. But, you know, we probably just worried needlessly. So many hours kept us up at night. Things from work. And it's a waste of time and it's a waste of energy. And Solomon has come to that conclusion. He, he has realized that as he's come to the latter part of his life. So what does God expect us to do with the provisions from his hand? And that's what he says. There's another, nothing better for a person than to eat, drink, and enjoy his work. I have seen that even this is from God's hand. Okay. And he wants us to enjoy them. So, you know, our daughter Haley has just been on this roller coaster over the last, I would say, year. Uh, of job hunting, you know, ever since COVID kind of shut down where she was working and um, and she wasn't sure when her store was going to open back up, she just kind of been on this roller coaster. What, do, what is it I want to do? And one of the phrases that kept coming up was work-life balance. I don't think I'd ever heard that. I'd always thought about that and I'd always tried to achieve it, but I don't think I'd ever heard it. In her old job, there was just work. There was no work slash life balance. There was no balance, period. Even on her days off, she would receive phone calls and text messages about work. Uh, there was one day she was on vacation and, and she'd come back home and we were enjoying time together. We were getting ready to go eat dinner in Lexington. And um, she had a phone call from her boss saying that you need to get this done, this done, this done, and this done. And she's like, okay, but I'm on, you know, paid time off right now. That didn't matter. Had to get that done. And Solomon recognized that there needed to be that kind of balance. He recognized God's hand in his wealth and knew that God had created it for it to be enjoyed and, and to share with others in that enjoyment. All right. So, you know, again, I enjoy eating. Pam and I enjoy cooking, but we also enjoy eating. So where do the good things, though, in life, where, where do they come from? And they come from God, all of them. All good things come from God. Now, either we recognize that and we give God the glory for that, or we don't, but it doesn't make any difference. It comes from God. God showers out blessings on us. And the only thing that keeps him from giving us more blessings, generally speaking, is us. Okay? And, and it's just a matter of turning our lives over to him and allowing him to just shower us with even more blessings. And again, I'm not talking necessarily about wealth, all right? I don't want you to hear that. I'm talking about blessings. So what, what lessons do we learn from this today? Well, if we seek to please only ourselves, what can we expect from this life? Well, Solomon says it over and over and over and over, and it's futility. Yeah, there are pleasures. There, there are pleasures in the things of this world. I get a kick out of this, and I've mentioned this before just in our Sunday school classes. Anytime you get a new car, it may not be brand new, but it's new to you. That first month you park it, you're walking either into a store, you're walking into your home or wherever, you always just kind of look back at that car, don't you? When you've bought it, it's been detailed, it looks brand new, it looks sharp, you wanna know how sharp it looks, and you turn around looking for a little while, you get that feeling. Then that just kinda of goes away, and no longer do you go back, in fact, you just kinda of lock it, and beep, beep, and you don't even look back there at it, okay? This world tries to tell us what's gonna make us happy, and what is going to take up all of our time and all of our energy in chasing those things. But Solomon reminds us that the wise and the fool will surely die. Whether you're wise or whether you're foolish, you're going to die. Life is short for both. Seek God, not see God. See God, that works as well. See God and his wisdom. 
So how can we glorify God with our lives and the gifts that he provides? Well, first we recognize where those gifts come from. Okay, we give God the credit for that. We don't take the credit for that. We don't we don't pat ourselves on the back or we don't uh, thank man. That doesn't mean that we aren't grateful to those who, who give us things. All right. But we got to understand that ultimately these are the things that come from God and they're gifts. But that's what they are. They're gifts. We're not to worship those things. The things of this world are not to be worshipped. Only God is worthy of our worship. And we are created to worship God. That's our purpose. Guys, that's the meaning of life. Worship God. Glorify God. We don't worship people. We don't worship jobs, possessions, or anything else that takes our focus away from the one true God. He deserves our worship. And that is the meaning of life. All right, guys, thank you for joining me today. I hope this wasn't too long, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. If you're looking for a place to join us, we're, we're at Red House Baptist Church. We're meeting right now. Grace and Truth is meeting in the gymnasium, 915 Sunday mornings, and uh, getting ready to move into a classroom. But come join us. We'd love to have you. Love you guys. Thanks.